All right, so let's talk about defining the problem. 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain. That's one out of every three suffering from migraines, fibromyalgia, neck and back pain, rheumatoid arthritis, the list goes on. It's more than those who have cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. Chronic pain affects our lives drastically. 47.5 million people reported a disability last year. The two largest groups were chronic pain patients with arthritis or back and spinal problems. Medical and lost productivity expenses cost Americans over $600 billion each year. There is a huge overlap of chronic pain patients suffering from depression, anxiety, or PTSD, conditions which alone cost an additional $138 billion a year. The success rate for chronic pain and depression treated separately is 47%. Over 50% of patients suffer from both, making successful treatment an abysmal 9%. Narcotic sales are through the roof for chronic pain sufferers, but research shows they just don't work. Narcotics can target the pain, but not the problem. It's time to rethink how we treat chronic pain. It all starts in one place, the brain. New research shows chronic pain and depression are not diseases, but symptoms. These symptoms are the result of an inflammation in the brain brought on by a host of factors including prior injury or disease, environmental factors, even stress and emotional factors. A brain on fire. We need a completely new approach to research and treatment. Instead of masking the pain, doctors can focus on identifying and treating the sources of the inflammation, increasing the successful treatment for patients. There's still much to learn about how inflammation starts, what makes it better, and how to prevent it. Let's bring together the world's experts to find a cure and bring hope to chronic pain sufferers. It's a massive problem. It's a massive problem from an economic standpoint. The human toll is absolutely beyond conception. We have a huge number of people struggling every day to get through the day. We have a huge number of people looking for answers. And the problems are multiplied by what we in the medical profession do because we don't treat the disease that we're actually struggling with. What we treat is the symptoms, and we have to quit treating that. This whole lecture is about what the disease is and how to go about treating it. So what's chronic pain, okay? I don't have chronic pain. Well, wait a minute, my back hurts every single day. My neck hurts every single day. I have a generalized pain syndrome called fibromyalgia. I have migraines that are occurring three, four times a week. I have other headaches that are occurring every single day, okay? This is chronic pain. Osteoarthritis, most people with osteoarthritis do not have pain. A small subset of them do. There's difference, so just having osteoarthritis doesn't mean you should have pain. So if you're having chronic pain associated with that, then we're missing something, and we need to understand what it is, and it's not enough to just say it hurts because you have osteoarthritis. There is no correlation between x-rays, MRIs, CT scans, and pain. Okay? Just because it shows up on the scan doesn't mean that's the cause of your pain. It might be, but it doesn't have to be. And in fact, the majority of the time, it doesn't correlate. I have seen absolutely devastating x-rays with somebody with no pain whatsoever. And I see many x-rays and MRIs that are completely normal with people who are fairly incapacitated by their pain. So the scan doesn't tell us whether or not you have pain. You tell me whether or not you have pain. So the first thing that we learned a long time ago was, what if the beginning isn't the beginning? And this is a story that I relate in my book, but, or a similar story that's in the book, but what it talks about is a young woman who came to see us who was struggling with what's called complex regional pain syndrome, a really horrific pain situation. And what had happened was she had gotten kicked in the knee a couple of years earlier and ended up with unrelenting pain in her leg that then proceeded to progress throughout her entire body. Multiple, multiple medical interventions, uh, several surgeries, uh, and progressively worse. She went through a program at the University of Pennsylvania where they take these kids and put them through really rigorous uh, physical therapy in an attempt to reset the pain receptors. They weren't quite sure what they were doing, but they figured they could reset the receptors, toughen these kids up. And in fact, it works as long as you're 16 years or younger. 
there's enough plasticity in the brain, enough ability for the brain to rewire at those ages that you can do that. It doesn't work so well past that age. She did respond to this and in fact got significantly better. But shortly after being in the program started to develop chronic daily headaches, started to develop problems with fatigue. So she was getting increasingly disabled again. When we saw her, we took the history back. So yeah, lots of kids at 15 years of age get kicked in the knee, but they don't develop pain. So why does this kid get sick? Well, we go back in her history, and what do we find? We find that she, three, four years earlier, before the knee got kicked, had Lyme disease. We find that she also had a poisonous spider bite. In fact, we find that she had two cases of Lyme disease. So then we said, OK, what's the problem here? And we addressed those issues, believing that they, in fact, may have been the beginnings of the problem. And when we addressed those issues, she got better. And we were able to ship her off to school. She's at school for about a month, and she gets bit by a poisonous spider. I can't make this stuff up. Everything comes back. Everything comes rip-roaring back on her. We again treat the issue of toxicity from the spider bite. Everything goes away. This was the canary in the coal mine, the first individual that really set us into this idea of what on earth is going on here. So we think of kicked in the knee is when it started. We need the complete history. We need to understand that chronic pain is typically not the result of an event, but the end result of a whole series of events that have led up to this. And the neurophysiology of the brain tells us that this makes sense. What we find in looking in chronic pain and depression, and the reason we look at chronic pain and depression, is because both are actually symptoms of neuroinflammatory disease. Neuroinflammatory disease is a spectrum disorder. On one end of that spectrum is chronic pain and depression, but also on that spectrum is multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's. That doesn't mean you necessarily progress from one to the other, but they all are variations on a theme in the presentation of neuroinflammatory disease. These particular conditions share a common neurobiology, neuroanatomy, neuroendocrinology, neuroimmunology, and there's a set of neurotransmitters that we see disrupted in both these conditions. We know that in mapping the brain that there's an overlap of the neuroanatomy that's affected by these, both these conditions and that they have a multiplier effect on each other, which is why if you have just chronic pain, our odds of success in treating you is much higher or if you just have depression, our odds of successfully treating you is much higher than if you have both diseases at the same time. So there's something different about the people that are much sicker, the people who are struggling with both depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and chronic pain. We know that both diseases, we see inflammatory cytokines uh, alter the metabolism of serotonin and dopamine in both these diseases. We know that there's dysregulation of serotonin and norepinephrine in both these conditions, and we know that there's dysregulation of glutamate. We know that there's endocrine disruptions that occur in both these conditions. And the interesting thing that occurs, and some people focus on low adrenals creating the fatigue, okay? But the reality of the matter is the adrenals, there's nothing wrong with them. The problem comes in the brain. And what happens in a chronic inflammatory process in the brain the hippocampus, which is one of the highest turnover of cells in the brain, of the dendritic nuclei, actually is very sensitive to inflammation in the brain and shrinks. The amygdala then gets overpowers the input coming from the hippocampus on the hypothalamic regions, and corticotropin releasing factor gets distorted, and this axis doesn't work well. So you get a distortion in the way it responds. Meanwhile, in the meantime, your endocrine action isn't working well. This in, in impacts your sleep, this impacts your digestive system, but at the basis is a neuroinflammatory disease. We see elevations in a number of different cytokines. We see interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tissue necrosing factor alpha, and loss of gray matter. Okay, this latter is particularly important because the longer this disease goes on, the smaller your brain gets. We see atrophy of the brain. So depression, depression and chronic pain are both neuroinflammatory. 
They're both neurodysregulatory. The way the brain talks to itself, the way information moves in the brain is disrupted. And they are neurodegenerative. When we look at an MRI of a 60-year-old and we see a report that says normal age-related atrophy, ain't nothing normal about that. That's a brain that's been chronically inflamed. Makes your brain smaller. So what's inflammation? Because inflammation is a lot of different things in the body. So inflammation, if you skin your knee and it gets infected, it gets red and pussy, what's happened there is you have an infection there. Okay, you have bacterial infection. The way you want to go treat that is with an antibiotic. You have hay fever, your nose is running, your eyes are itchy, you may have asthma. Okay, you're not going to use an antibiotic on that. That you want to use an antihistamine because the cells mediating, the way that inflammation occurs in the body, is different than what's occurring in the case of a skin knee. So we need to understand what are the things that inflame the brain and how it reacts. Because if we understand that, we can begin to understand what questions we need to be asking in order to get the right solutions.